tough on me. He says, can you come and can you help? I'm going to be out on vacation. And, of course, I love to do that. Being with you guys is a joy. Peggy and I have talked about this on the drive over. It's just fun being here. You guys are uh, you're a great church. Yeah, it's a great church. And But then he says, oh, and by the way, here's your text. <laughs> and so this text we're in this morning, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 5 to 12. I opened a commentary this week. And the first thing it said about this section of the Bible says, now we come to the most difficult portion of, pa- of Scripture in the entire New Testament. <laughs> and I think, okay, he's buried me again. So we're going to attack a tough part this morning. But as you were uh, probably led to turn there, I have a marker in mind, so it's easier. I want to start in Acts chapter 17 which you may have covered already in this series, but I would be unaware of that because I wasn't here. So read with me in Acts chapter 17, starting at verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, this Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ. He's done this for three weeks, or at least two. If he arrived there just ahead of the Sabbath, he had three Sabbaths to reason with them, and at least the two weeks between. And I I just encourage us in this thought, too, Paul didn't have the New Testament to work with, right? So he was convincing from the Old, Old Testament scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah and that he needed to die and rise again. He had a command of the scriptures. We know that Paul was a Pharisee. He was an expert in the law that had had an encounter with the writer of the law on the road to Damascus, spent a couple of years in the desert being tutored by the author. So he knew what he was talking about. And so he reasoned with them. And verse 4 says, And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace, and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they didn't find them, they dragged Jason and some brothers to the rulers of the cities, crying out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them. And these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. Then immediately the brothers sent Paul away to go to the sea, but both Silas and Timothy remained there. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. Just this is the background of the setting. He's in Thessalonica, he preaches, trouble rises. There's conflict. There's an attack against them. And no doubt after they left, the persecution fell to the church in Thessalonica. Difficulty was on them. And this is the background. This is the place we start from for the two letters of Thessalonians, is that the church is under stress and pressure. And they had heard Paul talk about the fact that Jesus would come again. And we talked about this a little bit last week, that Jesus would come. But before he would come, there would be great persecution. So because they were under persecution so immediately and they'd heard the message that Jesus would return in that atmosphere, some of them had actually just quit their jobs, quit working, saying it's already happened, he's already come. And then there was some kind of a letter that had been circulated or maybe even a prophetic voice that had announced that the day of the Lord had already come or it had been a teaching, we're unsure. 
But nonetheless, they were distracted and they were fearful. So Paul sent Timothy back to talk to them while he was doing that Athens trip. Sent him back to get a good word to them and get a report from them. He brought it back to Paul, and Paul was rejoicing that they were doing okay, but he wrote him 1 Thessalonians to encourage them about the second coming of Jesus and to put it down in factual writing so that they could keep what he called the traditions handed from the apostles to the church, always hang on to the traditions. And if, you, if you've uh, got your Bible marked there in Thessalonians, you know, you can see this a little further ahead in chapter 3. In verse 6, he says, We command you, brothers, in the name of, the Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he, we, he received from us. Also in verse 10, For even when we were with you, we commanded you to do this. Hang on to the traditions. And if any man doesn't work, then he's not going to eat. The traditions were those things that the Lord had spoken to the apostles and taught them directly. And they had repeated to the church. And this is how they knew things would occur, right? They knew it straight from Jesus to the apostles to the congregations that were coming to know Christ. The Thessalonians were shaken by some other word that came. And if we push the pause button right there and ask ourselves, what around us troubles us? There's much going on these days by word, by prophetic utterance, books, writings, teachings, uh, there is a myriad of things we can draw from and then call for our attention that talk to us regularly about the last days, right? I mean, we asked last week, how many think we're living in the last days? And we shake our heads. We go, I'm, I'm in that group. I feel like it's tomorrow. And wouldn't that be great? You know, you know, we already did rapture practice last week, so <laughs> we don't have to do it this week. I always feel powerful when that happens. I feel like I have some electronic ability to go, to go whoosh, 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 and disappear or something. The sound effects. So in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we covered the first few verses, but let's read those as well. Now, brothers, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Don't you remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? So he's referring in this letter back to conversations he's had with them personally recently. In my mind, it's probably within six weeks to two months that he's writing these letters back to them. The conversation is fresh in their minds. Unfortunately for us, and here's why. In the next few verses, there are references made to individuals, persons, events, and or political structures that are not specified for us. We're still guessing about them. There's more than five different definitions for the few verses we're about to read. There are more than five interpretations of what it, what it could mean. And the point of it, as we read through, I hope we can understand this this morning together, is that Paul is writing to a group of people that already know the conversation is in place. And so he doesn't specify it for us. And I kind of want to be tickled inside a little bit. On two points. One, this is a very difficult passage of Scripture for us to get a hold of sometimes. But two, God knows all about it. <laughs> he doesn't. You know you can't surprise God? Did you ever think about that? Try and surprise him. He already knows. And when I think about the way he inspired the writings of the New Testament, he inspired Paul to write it this way. And in one sense, elected to leave us without specifics. You may recall the quote I gave you last week from Warren Wiersbe that says, prophecy is given to us not so that we can make calendars, but that we can build character. What's our response to prophetic utterance from God? It's always to build character and to draw closer to him. It's always to let us know that he knows what's coming in the future, whether we do or not, and we're going to be safe if we hang right on to him. Amen? 
Verse 6. And now you know what is restraining and that he may be revealed, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only who, he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie that they all may be consumed who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Just reading that resounds back to me and says, this is a tough passage. But we can find some general insights. We can get a hold of some principles to live by by looking at this passage. And now you know what is restraining. The word what in the original language is neutral. So it's not talking about a he or a she. It could be talking about a political system. It could be talking about the Jewish state itself. It could be referring to uh, the Roman government. It, it could even refer to Paul's own incomplete ministry, saying that there are things that are restraining this man of lawlessness from appearing in complete form. The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Look with me in, in, in 1 John chapter 2. Y'all must be using electronics because I don't hear any pages turning. <laughs> I guess I'm old school. First John chapter 2, verse 18. Little, and here's maybe just a thought that occurred to me, the Thessalonian letters are probably the first letters written, the first early works of the New Testament. John is one of the last writers. So you have this parenthetic effect on the entire scriptures of the New Testament that we're just covering right now. Paul wrote first, John's writing last. Everything else is written in between. And John says this, little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard, that the Antichrist is coming. Even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. But you, you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I haven't written to you because you don't know the truth, but because you do know it and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Chapter 4, verse 3 and 2. But verse 2, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. We should leave out verse 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. This is our promise. I'm going to say to Bobby, I don't know how you chose your songs this morning, but I, I actually look and listen and sing with purpose. It's more than just singing songs. It's worship. And, and this young man actually preached the message for us in the worship service. It was awesome. And you might, I, in fact, I wanted to grab copies of the songs. I could just lay them up here again and preach from them. But to end on the very fact that how great is our God even though we sang earlier in the worship service, trials and suffering and trouble are going to come. And even in those, I'm going to choose to worship, right? And when, the, when those things attack, when the difficulties are in front of me, I'm still going to choose to worship him. What does this tell us? It tells us that we're going to suffer. 
<laughs> Jesus said, what? In this world, you're going to have tribulation. Everybody want to throw your hand in the air and say, praise God. I'm looking forward to that. No, but we're going to have tribulation. There's going to be trouble. There's going to be stuff that rocks our world. And when the darkness closes in, I choose to sing. I choose to worship. I choose to declare that the greater one is still in control and that he lives in me. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. You know, there are going to be a few skirmishes we're going to lose, individually, maybe even corporately. But they're just skirmishes. The battle is already won. Jesus has the victory, and we're going to go on in with him. Amen? Yeah. The man of sin be revealed, that's fine. We're still on the winning team. And some of you are probably old enough to know the song. I don't know the whole song. I just heard part of it that says, we win, we win. Hallelujah, we win. I read the back of the book, and we win. The Antichrist, the word Antichrist is actually used in this epistle, John's epistle. But he's referred to in other places in the Bible, like in the section we're taking out of Thessalonians this morning. We know that the mystery of lawlessness is at work. You know, part of the mystery of lawless for me, when I read this, I think the mystery is, why does it continue? Why can't people see how crazy it is to live without Christ? Why is it that people can keep adding to lawless deeds and lawless acts and continue to just struggle through their life without an answer that comes from Christ alone? That is a mystery to me. Maybe not that's, that may not be the piece that he, Paul's trying to write about, but it is a mystery to me that when there's a solution, why would you bypass it every day of your life? When there's an answer, when we can live by the promises of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the Master of the Universe, if we can get a hold of what He's given us, so we sang about that this morning too, living by promise. When that's available to me, why would I want to continue just stumbling through in the darkness? It is a mystery. But the mystery of lawlessness is at work. You know, the Bible talks about the mystery of godliness as well. The mystery of godliness was finally displayed to us in the person of Jesus. Jesus became the bodily form of the mystery of godliness. What this parallel says is that there will also be a bodily form given to the mystery of lawlessness. In the last days there will rise an antichrist, one person. And he's going to exalt himself above God. It's nothing new. Isaiah 14. Have you read Isaiah 14? You know what it says. I hear those buttons being pushed as the pages change on your electronic Bible. Isaiah 14, 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart... I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. This is the declaration of Lucifer, exalting himself into the position of God. In the last days there will come one who will eventually personify this attitude and this style once again. In Thessalonians, says the son of perdition is going to appear. The man of lawlessness is held back by something right now. Paul writing to the Thessalonians, nonspecific for us. One of those things is that the Spirit of God is still alive in the church. And the church is still in place. And that restrains lawlessness. I have a simple illustration about that for me and you. We run down the mountain. We hop on the freeway. And we take off with the rest of them, right? I mean... We don't want to be ticketed for impeding the flow of traffic. I'm always amazed at how fast the freeways move in Southern California when they're not jammed up. You know, I'm in the diamond lane all the time if I can be. I'd be one of those guys who would get a blow-up guy would put a hat on him in the next seat so I could be in the diamond lane, but I don't do that. I don't have thought about it. But I would almost pay somebody minimum wage to just ride with me so I can be in the diamond lane. But you get in the diamond lane, and it has a different definition. It's not posted anywhere. It's called the high-speed lane. 
You know, because you can't go the speed limit in that lane without getting run over or beat up and people jumping in and out on you. And until what? Until on the on-ramp you see this little black and white car rolling up. And it is such a dynamic. I just love to watch it happen. Hopefully I'm not in a hurry myself. You know, not even one, you know, I'm not late for something. If I'm just driving somewhere, it's not a problem. I'm in the flow, and it's moving. And we're, we are like a whole bunch of us lawlessness all at once. And then black and white rolls up the on-ramp. And the whole thing, like it hit a sand trap, just right to 65 or whatever they posted. <laughs> and he just gets in the crowd for a little bit. He slows things down, and then he leaves and up we go again, right? We're like the CHP. We're like the black and white unit. It's always funny when you see one that rolls up and it says out of service, but nobody's noticed yet. <laughs> and as soon as somebody spots it, they take the lead. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Why? Because there's a mystery of lawlessness. It's just around us all the time, this anti-godness. The thing that says, I'm man, and I can do it myself. I make my own rules. I live by my way. You know, that's the same problem that happened in the Garden of Eden, the pride of man. Tempted to be like God, be your own God. Make your own rules. The church in the world right now is probably one of the only things that's holding the man of lawlessness back. And we look forward to the day when we're caught up to meet him in the air. That would be like taking every black and white unit off the road all at once. And this thing's going to go out of control. Lawlessness is going to prevail. And the one who's going to come and lead the world down the primrose path of destruction, the man of perdition, is very much like Judas. Judas is almost the illustration of the man of lawlessness or the son of perdition, right? Jesus said when he prayed, I haven't lost one that the Father gave me. Not one's escaped my hand. I've taken care of every single one the Father gave me except the son of perdition that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Son of perdition could be defined like this. It's a person who knew the truth. It's a person who walked in truth. It's a person that knows the scriptures, who knows truth, but then elects to leave it and walk away. One of the illustrations I read in one of my commentaries said that right now, presently, there is an instructor, a professor at USC, I forget which department he's in, who was once a very strong believer, taught the word of God, preached the word of God to others, and then decided he was no longer going to believe it. Now he's spending the rest of his professorship trying to take the truth out of other people, trying to teach them out of believing in Christ. I go, wow, not really interested in sending my kids to USC at this point at least not to that department, because higher education has taken over and he's decided he knows more than God. He's become a son of perdition, one that's been lost because he no longer believes the truth. Paul was pretty specific about what happens to these individuals in this passage. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, all power signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they may all be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The son of perdition Sounds to me like driven along and, and the man of lawlessness, just the verses ahead of that. The lawless one will be revealed. The Lord will consume him, right? With the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. We sang it again this morning, right? I'm trying to get the words again. He wraps himself in light and darkness tries to hide. When Jesus comes, he's going to have no place to hide. Son of perdition, Isaiah 14. Most, most of us, I think, in Christendom, 
believe that Lucifer was the choir director of heaven. He was the song leader. He was the worship master. And he decided, I'm going to raise myself up above God. In the last days, another one will come along, personified in body, and begin to say to people, I am God. I'm higher than him. I'm greater than him. I am to be worshipped. Oh, excuse me, I'm just checking the text. I'm kidding. <laughs> you might have believed that. Actually, I have my Bible here too. The name Antichrist is found only in 1st and 2nd John, although there Anyone who denies Christ is labeled an antichrist, yet Bible writers do recognize the actual end-time person who will appear to oppose Christ in its entire flowering implications. Thus, the events of the last days and the person of the antichrist are inseparable. While the spirit of the antichrist pervades the whole Christian era, an actual individual will arise to climax and bring to a sinful close human history without God. You know, over the period of our time even, there have been those who've been pointed at as the Antichrist. Hitler, Mussolini, we go back further, we get Alexander the Great. We have a list here. You know, Babylon had Nebuchadnezzar, Medo-Persia had Cyrus, Greece had Alexander the Great, and Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes. All of these were just leading to another one that will come. The life of the Antichrist, briefly sketched, has the following salient points in the life history of the future Antichrist. Listen to this. There's 10 of these things. One, he'll have an inconspicuous beginning. There was a woman who actually interviewed Hitler. I forget her name right now, but after she left his presence, she said, it was within 50 seconds I concluded that this nondescript, almost faceless man would never rise to be the dictator of Germany. Alexander the Great was 25. Nobody even really knew who he was. But within four years, he became Alexander the Great. Inconspicuous beginnings. He makes a treaty with Jews for seven years, overcomes some resistance in uniting Europe. He becomes the head of ten-nation European confederacy, he is attacked by kings of the south and north and is killed, but his deadly head wound is healed. Revelation chapter 13. He becomes the world ruler, breaks Jewish treaty, and stops temple sacrifices. He kills the two witnesses. He usurps divine worship. He persecutes the Jews. He kills 144,000 evangelists, destroys the world church. He is defeated at Armageddon by Christ. And he's cast alive. I like the way it said that he's defeated by Christ at Armageddon. He's not killed because he's cast forever alive into the lake of fire. What is the character? What is the nature of this Antichrist? High intelligence, number one. Two, he's great speaking ability. He's a convincer. You know, in times of trouble, we, I mentioned Hitler, and some of you know your history. When Hitler came to, to become the dictator, everything was just ripe for the picking. There was nothing left. The value of their currency had sunk to nothingness. And they were looking for anything that could help them. And he stood up and said, I can do this. People said, great, do it, and we'll follow you. The same kind of thing will happen in the last days. There'll be trouble, destruction, devaluation of currencies worldwide, and if anybody's into currencies today, you kind of know that's happening. You know, they're earmarks of what's going on. Values are lower than ever. There's always somebody promising a better future, but one day it's going to be so bad that we'll take anybody that'll stand up and say, I'll lead you. And that will be a part of the great deception. They'll have a strong physical appearance. They'll have crafty political talents. These are all Derived from scripture, by the way. I didn't just make up a list. Okay, these I should probably tell you where they're found. He morally is the worst personage. Materialistic. He's a blasphemer against the law. He has selfish ambition. He tries to change prophecy and history. And he substitutes himself from, for God. There are, these are just earmarks of what we can believe will be apparent about the Antichrist. 
He'll fit all those. The unfortunate part is those who have not received truth will love it. This is our answer. This is a great political leader. This is exactly what we need. So there will be a great deception in the last days. Now, I don't know if you're swallowing hard or if I'm just boring you, which is fine. I've bored others before. I'm kind of used to it. Oh, I'm just kidding. You guys need to laugh a little here. I need like a joke right here or something, but this isn't a very joking matter, is it? It's kind of hard to find. I look for funny illustrations. There aren't many funny illustrations about the Antichrist. These are difficult times. And we, like John, believe it's the last hour. And don't forget, last week we read about it from Peter, those that say, well, where's the sign of his coming? Come on, all things remain as they always have been. Is he really coming back? We could take that position too. Well, John thought it was the last days. Well, the spirit of lawlessness was already at work. The man of lawlessness was already there. It's been continuing in every generation, but it's still restrained until God's perfect timing comes into play. He cannot decide when things are going to happen. He's not in charge. God's in charge. And greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. What do we do? I still come back to what I said last week. For us, our responsibility isn't to try and get all the timing right. Some can do that. There are teachers of the word that are way better at this than I am. I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. I'm not the teacher type that lines everything up and puts it all in order, makes perfect sense out of it. I can't do that. But I can tell you that our responsibility is to draw nigh to him so that he draws nigh to us. Our responsibility is to know Jesus intimately. Why? Because he said, you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. He is the truth, right? I am the way. He's not the way shower. He doesn't point the way. He is actually the way. I am the truth. I don't talk about truth. I don't tell truthful things. I am truth, Jesus said. And I am the life. I'm not just handing out life. I am the life. That's why when you're born again and he comes to live within you, you are alive forevermore. He is life to us. Amen? And when he says you'll know truth and the truth will make you free, the rendering in the original language is that it's like a key going into a lock. It acts, it acts upon you. When you know truth, truth acts upon you and comes like a key and breaks the lock open. Where you were bound before, when truth comes and revelation comes, you're made free. And I believe in the last days, those who are free because of truth and the person of Jesus Christ will not be deceived. You're not going to be fooled. You're going to see it for what it is. Have you heard the story about the tellers in the banks, how they train them? They never let them play with counterfeit money. They always work with the real thing. That's why when you're standing there and they're counting your money, they're not even looking at it. They're just going through it, counting, and they'll stop. Oop. This one's not real. How did you know that? I can feel it. And then they'll examine it and they'll do their little strip thing and call the manager over and you just lost your $20 or 50 or whatever it was. Why? Because they're always handling truth. And when the lie shows up, you'll spot it. When the truth makes you free and you live in the freedom of Jesus Christ, these things aren't scary. These things are not scary. What should move us, though, as believers, is knowing that there are those around us who have yet to hear truth, who have yet to be set free, those who don't know Christ, who are headed for deception in last days. Maybe they're your family members. Maybe they're those that you work with and you love. You really care about them. My brother lives right next door to me. Actually, I should say that the other way around. He was there first. I moved in next door to my brother. So I live next door to my brother. We'll put it that way. And there isn't a day that I don't walk down my driveway thinking, is he going to heaven or not? And I'm, I'm, 
Can you imagine? I'm just trying to work up the courage after preaching to the church for more than 30 years to walk next door and ask my brother if he's going to heaven. I don't think I'm alone in that situation. Most of us have somebody we really do care about who has yet to know the truth and to be set free. And if they were set free today, we would be rejoicing with them forever that no matter how hard it gets, we'll spend eternity with Christ. We won't be deceived. We'll walk in truth and we'll walk in life because Jesus said when you know truth, you're free and you'll have abundant life. So we do have some, something we should feel about this message this morning. Whether it's the best message I've ever preached or not, I doubt but it's still true. It's still true. Is that we're free and he lives within us. I feel like if I have my hand in Jesus' hand and he moves, I get to move with him. Right? If he lives inside of me in the life I live, I now live by the faith of the Son of God. Then when he moves, I move with him. I want to live that life with Christ like he lived with the Father where he didn't do anything except for what he saw the Father doing and say what he heard the Father saying. Can you imagine if you walked up to Jesus on any given day of the week and said, Jesus, what are you doing? He would say, I'm doing what the Father did. What are you saying? I'm saying what the Father said to me. I don't act on my own. It's not my will that I'm living out. I'm living out the Father's will. And when things got tough, what did Jesus do? He withdrew to a private place to spend time with the Father. You and I spending time with the Father will gain strength and live in co in perfect agreement with the Lord Jesus Christ and people are going to see that and it's going to be a marked difference between you and the world. And when the world moves in the wrong way, you won't go with it. You'll be protected from the inside. Antichrist might come. Anti, by the way, has two meanings. Antichrist, one of course obvious against Christ. The other meaning is in place of. To be Antichrist means to try and replace him and get in his spot. And when we see that happening, whether it's in a group or an individual or in the world or personified in the last days, we will not be deceived by it because truth has set us free. I'm going to quit while I'm ahead. I feel at least like I'm a little bit ahead. And Pastor Bill could be the judge of that when he watches it or listens to it. He can give me a passing score or failing grade. Either way, we made it through this morning. So how many of you know 1 John 4, 4? You've tucked it away in your heart. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And it follows on the heels of the passage where John is describing what an antichrist is. You're not him. <laughs> Don't let him tell you you are. And when you fail and fall and the enemy comes and says, hey, you're one of us, you say, no, I'm not. I'm not. I just slipped and fell. We sang about it this morning. There's a time when that's going to happen, but I still get to get up again and move forward because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. The man of lawlessness, the son of perdition, the spirit that's pressing ahead in the kingdom around us cannot overtake us. Would you say it with me? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Father, this morning, we trust your word. We trust that you know what you're doing. Father, I thank you for the way this has come together this morning. I thank you for your leading, for Bobby and the worship team and the songs we sang that allude to the truth and drive the point home for us that in the tough times, we'll still be able to worship you. In the difficulty of the world around us, we have hope. When we fail, we know that it's not permanent, but your grace comes to lift us up again. And that ultimately and always, we can trust that greater is he that's in us. You, Lord, living your life in us, not us living our own lives, but you living your life out through us is greater than anything that goes on in the world. We pray that, Father, you would strengthen our priorities in living, that we would not derive our life and strength from our own way, but from your ways. Teach us your truth. Walk, help us to walk in your paths and know your ways and to be like you and demonstrate who you are in the earth. 
We pray this in Jesus' name, that Jesus, you would be glorified, that your church would be strong, and the body of Christ would truly be filled with overcoming and abundance in any kind of difficulty. Pray that your joy in us would be made full as we spend time with you. Lord Jesus, we honor you and we pray these things in your name. Amen.